Well, good morning to you. And they say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And how wonderful that news comes to us today. So we're so glad you're here with us. Um, we're going to get through this worship. Linda, you have an announcement about Lutheran World Relief? Am I on? Yep. Thank you very much. The mission project of the personal care kits is coming to a close. Um, the next week is the last week we'll be collecting money or items because then we have to count and make sure we have everything. And on the 17th uh, after second service, I hope you'll all stay for a few minutes and assemble kits and get them all packed. So we'll be all ready. I will probably be asking for boxes, so I'll be looking for maybe 14 by 16 size boxes to pack them in. So if you have any Amazon ones or about that size, please save them for us. Thank you very much, and I'll be here collecting monetary donations if you so wish. Thank you. And, and I want to thank you, Linda, for that ministry. Every year you make sure you do this. And it has been such a blessing to the congregation and to the people, especially on the receiving end. So thank you for that. Okay, you all look like you're getting ready to work. Well, I will let you get to work. Let us arise as a congregation. Thank you for being here.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. We enjoy singing praises to God, but we truly need him to look down on us in mercy. So often we fail to follow the directives for Christian living, which we will read about in today's epistle. So James urges, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Let us ask God for grace and mercy. We pray silently to the Lord. James writes, Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Do not grumble against one another, brothers. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Is anyone among you sick? Pray over him. We confess our impatience, our lack of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and our words that do not always reflect the love you have for us. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Heavenly Father, our only hope is in your grace and mercy. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. God has cured our sickness, our sickness of sin, by sending his Son to die in our place. He values us and calms our fears, saying, Have salt in yourselves and be at peace. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The, the Old Testament reading comes from the 11th chapter of Numbers. Now the rabble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? that you lay the burden of all of this people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your, in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you are swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all, of this, all these people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry for all of these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretched, wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather, me, gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. And they did not, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. So, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? 
would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put this spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from the fifth chapter of James, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> Come now, you rich, weep and hollow and howl for the min- miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver has corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job, And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your eyes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will have the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Have salt in yourselves. And be at peace with one another. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell through the unquenchable fire. And your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. While their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated for the children's message. Okay, let's talk about our let's talk about our message today. Okay, so 
What do you think's inside my bag? Um, mystery. It is a mystery. A mystery. Let's see what's in here. Are you ready? It is something you can eat. It's salt. What do we use salt for? Salt makes food taste better, doesn't it? Yeah. What do you like to put salt on? I like to put salt on some on pasta. On pasta, yeah. yeah. French fries. Ooh. I like salt on French fries. Did you know that there's salt in chocolate cake? And cookies? What? That's too much. Salt. Salt makes a lot of foods taste better. But guess what? There's other things that salt does. I used to live in Pennsylvania where it got very snowy. And when the roads got icy and snowy, there would be big trucks that would go out and they would put salt on the roads because the salt melted the ice and it made it safe to drive. Yeah. Right. And did you know that you can use salt to clean things? Salt will take stains out of clothes. I don't like salt. And salt can even can even polish things. Like if you have a silver or pewter candlestick that gets dingy, you could use salt to polish it and make it shiny and new. Jesus wants us to be salt, which is kind of cool, huh? Because salt, you can use it for bug bites. You can heal sores if you ever had an ulcer in your mouth, if you rinse with salt. So salt can heal, it can clean, and it can restore things and make them shiny and new. That sounds a lot like what Jesus does for you and me, doesn't it? Yeah, and it makes food taste good, too. That sounds a lot like what Jesus does for you and me. So, Jesus asks us to be the salt of the world. So let's say this is you. That's what you put salt in. Right? And here's the thing. You can't be the salt of the world if you don't have salt in you. How do we get the salt inside us? Let me use it over the back. I know. How do we get salt inside us, the salt that Jesus wants us to have? When we come to church, when we go to Sunday school, when we read our Bibles, when we pray, those are the times that, I don't know what happened to my cat, that Jesus fills us, okay, with his love. And then that helps us to go out into the world and sprinkle his love on others. Do you see it in there? It's camouflage. <laughs> That's because the bag is white. Let's. I could give you a little bit. Okay. All right. So let's pray. Ready? <laughs> let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for filling us with your love and your forgiveness. Help us to take what we know and go out into the world and sprinkle that love on everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, go be salty.
Thank you. Let us uh, pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we thank you for allowing us to be here. To not only sing praises of your great glory and the great mystery which is found in your Son, Jesus Christ, but to be able to learn again how to live in this world, this world which so desperately needs what you have to offer. Help us, Lord, be vessels to which you fill your Holy Spirit's power and help us do what we were meant to do, whether it's in our families, our jobs, or just everywhere we walk in life. Help us be faithful to you as we tell others how faithful you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text. I want you to notice that there are three times here that he talks about the end times. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And do not grumble against one another. Brothers, so that you may not be judged, behold, the judge is standing at the door. It is... uh, James, just to go over James just a little bit, because James's epistle is, is different. James is talking to scattered Christians throughout the world, and he is Jesus' blood-related brother. Uh, he did not believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And James, like Paul, believed that the end of the world was coming soon, and Jesus was going to return in all his glory real soon. And so uh, James is in this letter, he's giving some advice on how we are to live with this coming forward. No matter where we are, these are things which are kind of universal in the way they can be carried out. It's important. And so James writes this. And let's face it, back then, Christians were going through some rough times. The Christian church was well protected for many years when it started. Many of the Romans believed that it was the same as the state-sanctioned Jewish church. So they just figured that those Christians who were once Jews were just Jews worshiping on another day, and everything was kosher. But as the distinctions between the Christians and the Jews started making more of a, a stance and the line in the sand was becoming clearer, then the Jews started turning in to the, you know, the, their, their Christian former brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith, they started turning them into the Romans. And so now, when the Romans realized that Christianity was not the state-sanctioned church they thought it was, then they went after it with a vengeance. And then they started listening to what they were talking about. You know, they were cannibals because they eat the body of the Lord and they drink the blood of Christ. I mean, Christians in the early church were, were thought to be cannibals, which kind of stands in the face of Christians today who believe that grape juice is what you should use. Um, or that Jesus' body and blood is not present in the, in the bread and the wine. There are some who believe it's just a symbol. But remember, the early Christians were being accused of cannibalism, so they were obviously talking about eating the, butter, the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ very clearly. So clearly. But did you know that non-Christians were not allowed to stay for communion? They were, Non-Christians were allowed to come to the worship services and take in the confession and the readings and some of the prayers, maybe. But when it came time for communion, the non-Christians were kicked out. And so they wondered, what happened in there? Oh, we heard that they're eating flesh in there. Oh, that's why we're not invited in there. And so these things happened. I mean, know this historically. Just an aside. Didn't know I'd go there. But I saw the sand, and I just went off on a tangent. Anyway, you have the Christians being persecuted, and they were persecuted. And this was one of the safest stories or pictures I could show about how they were persecuted. Flames in the back, you know what that is. And... uh, and then I had to find one where the lions hadn't already had a meal because those are kind of um, graphic. So, but Christians were being slaughtered. And so James is writing to them, be faithful. Jesus is coming soon, okay? Stand firm, be strong. And, uh, so, and, but James does an interesting thing that Paul doesn't do. Paul says the same things, but Paul spends a lot of energy in each of his epistles telling about what Jesus has done, like setting the the table, so to speak, saying, here's what God has done, therefore do this. James makes the assumption that the people who already know the story of Jesus, and he's just telling them, here's how you're to live. And and so they're both saying the same thing. They're just talking with a different context of who they're talking to in mind and why they're talking. I say that because the, the Lutherans have not been kind to the book of James because Luther struggled with the book of James because the book of James did not help him as much as he would like it to have done during the Reformation time, 
with the claims that the Roman Catholic Church was making at the time about works righteousness, Luther didn't see James as helping his argument as much. And also James, he said, doesn't really have a clear gospel in it. And so therefore it's like a, it's, it's about as useful as straw. And some people have taken that to mean that the book of James, Luther didn't deem as important. No, he deemed it very important. It just wasn't helping his argument like he was hoping it would. There were other texts which helped him much better, like Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God in advance prepared for us to do. That message, that passage seemed to have a lot more power in the Reformation scheme than some of James's teachings. But James's teachings are still valid. So what are James's teachings? What is God telling us to do? Well, folks, get ready. Blocking and tackling. You know what I'm talking about, football fans? You know, every football team, they have to start doing what? They have to start by blocking and tackling. You have to learn the fundamentals. Well, James is pointing to those things which make us as Christians the fundamentals. And here they are, starting from the upper left. He says, be patient, be patient. You know, when I'm not patient, it's a, re- it's a revelation of some things about God. I'm going to be honest with you. When I'm not patient, and when you're not patient, we're basically saying God doesn't know what he's doing, and he needs to work on our agenda, on our time frame. And I, I have to catch myself, because I do this quite often. I get in this mindset, because we're in a big city, and everybody's in a hurry. If you don't think so, get on the road anywhere from 7 in the morning till 9, or get on the road anywhere from 5 to about 7 in the afternoon, and you tell me that there's not an impatience problem in Houston. Or get into a Kroger where you, you, it's Saturday morning and there seems to be only one register open and all the ones that you can go self-help to, they're not open today for some reason. Yeah, watch what your patience does then. Um, so patient, he uses a farmer illustration, which is interesting because farmers have to learn a lot about that. They're, they're dependent on a lot of forces outside of their control. Uh, control is the real issue here, isn't it? That's what, that's what the real issue is with patience. It all goes back to that first commandment, you know, have no other gods before me. And when we're impatient a lot, it's us being God trying to control the situation. If you disagree with me on that, let's talk later. Maybe we might come to a consensus on that. But that's what I notice. The next one is quit grumbling. You know, you saw on the num- numbers thing, so encourage I put here. Because grumbling, I don't want you to walk away thinking, well, the, the sign said we should grumble. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Grumbling is the problem. And grumbling is a problem, isn't it? Haven't you noticed how once grumbling happens, it's like a wart, you know? It's, it's not really that big a deal. I was told today Richard Keating has really bad poison ivy. He wasn't able to be. He had to go to the emergency and, and, and deal with his poison ivy. Bad thing about poison ivy is what does it do? It spreads. And that's the problem with 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 grumbling. It just spreads. Once you start grumbling, it just becomes a a fuel that just starts spreading the grumbling. Because grumbling sometimes gets things done, and we see that, and we say, hey, that worked for them. Maybe it will work for me, and so we do it. Um, I remember, you know, I've told you this before. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. I had one person say, but sometimes squeaky wheels get replaced. And, And, you know, grumbling, grumbling doesn't get us anywhere. Look, even, even Moses, the people were grumbling against him. They were, they were delusional. They were slaves in Egypt, and yet they're talking about how beautiful and how wonderful it was in Egypt. They're, they've been in the sun too long. They, and Moses, what does he do? He gets that grumbling, and what does he do? Then he grumbles to God, and he basically says, I thought you loved me. If you really loved me, you wouldn't give me the responsibility of these people. Why don't you just kill me instead? And that's what grumbling does. And when we as God's people, when we grumble and when we complain, when we don't get our way and we make sure everybody around us knows it because we've learned the tricks and as we get older, we learn even better tricks, but it doesn't, it doesn't help. It's not what God wants for his people. He wants us to be the kind of people that can see things and possibilities even when there are no possibilities at present. Example, the cross. By all accounts, the cross looked like game over. The disciples thought it was game over. The Romans thought it was game over. The Jews were happy the game was over. And lo and behold, we find out that the cross, four centuries later, starts emerging in Christian art. 
because people started seeing victory where there was not victory before. And that's what God does. He takes things that don't make sense to the world and he turns them the right side up for the world to see, even though the world says, no, we, want to, we prefer to see it upside down. God says, I'm going to keep showing it to you. And he did that once and for all when he came as his son. And he says, you all carry it out as my body now. That's right, you're his body. That's why when we grumble against one another, it's like your hand arguing with your hand. <laughs> really? You got time for that? I don't have time for that. That's, what, that. that's why God uses the body image with us, to help us get away from this. Another thing he does in this passage, he says, confess your sins with one another. Why do we do that? Well, because there's a world that needs to know where you can get forgiveness for that. And we are the place, guaranteed. That's what this is about. God's body and blood, that's what the word is about right now. The readings are about, the hymns are about, the songs are about, trying to help you and understand how much God loves you and he forgives you. When we confess our sins, we humble ourselves before one another. We tell one another that I'm not above you. I've got the same problem and I need the same savior. Rather than a grumbling community, we become a community which appreciates and accepts the differences and the uniquenesses around us. But maybe you want to grumble a little more. I don't know. Sometimes I do. I'm going to be honest with you. This blocking and tackling sermon, it changed my week a bit in ways I didn't expect. It was kind of cool. I hope it does the same with you. Honesty. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. You know, if you're the one who's carrying the way, the truth, and the life, the truth in your body, then be that kind of person that has some integrity. If you can't do something, be the first one when you, when you let someone down. Be the first one to say, I am so sorry I let you down. You will be impressed by how people around you understand that. We all let people down. But how you handle those situations, how you're late for things, how you're, you know, it, it, that, that makes an impact. You want to do everything. The prayer that Pastor Leland and I had this morning before our worship services began was help us not to put any barriers in the way and to make way for the one of, called Jesus. And when we act like people were not meant to be, we put barriers in the way of people seeing Jesus and hearing Jesus from us. That's all. We know that to be true. But here's the thing about Christianity, which is unique. Even if you've been messing up all this time up to now, and even if you go from here and continue to mess up, you know what's cool about our God and his kingdom? He can still use you, and he will. You could be that person, and I hope you're not, the person who struggles with a certain sin or sins and you just can't seem to, to, to shirk it no matter what. You could get out down on yourself. You could think you're not a Christian, but that's not what God says. He says all of us have weaknesses. We all have things that, that hold us back. And maybe through that knowledge, just over and over again, eventually the grip that these things have on you will go away. And you realize the grip of God is greater and grander, and much more encouraging and wonderful. So be people that your yes is yes and your no is no, and pray for one another. We got to stop this nonsense about it doesn't matter where you worship, you know. I can worship at home, can I? Sure you can. But the book of James, which is God's word, says that we're to be praying for one another, the body. If we're not in church, we don't know who the body are, and we don't know what the needs are. Another thing that this passage really brought up to me is that thing about bringing the elders when we're sick. And this is something I've noticed with the pandemic. And I'm just going to say this as a theologian preacher. The church has a responsibility in the midst of every illness. Every illness is an opportunity for God's glory to be displayed in the way that the person might recover, in the way the person might go through it, in the way the people of God surround themselves around it. It could be a witness, an example. There's a spiritual dimension to our sicknesses that we don't want to acknowledge at times, but it's there. When I first came to Houston, I had to find a doctor. I found Dr. Paul Shepard. Some of you might know Paul Shepard. He might be your doctor. Let me tell you about Paul Shepard. He had a small practice on Loggenbau in, in Highway 6 here, and it burned. You might remember that was many years ago that, that, that burned out there. But he's moved out to Barker Cypress. When I first met him, he said, I see you're a pastor. I said, yeah. He says, I'm a Christian. And he said, you help me in my job, and I'm going to help you in yours. So until Obamacare came along, he used to give me free medical care. Obamacare changed everything. I'm going to be honest with you. And it's not his fault. I don't mind. But 
It was that cool discussion that I had with a doctor who realized that there was a spiritual dimension in the healing of God's people, no matter who they are, that there's a spiritual need. And that as a pastor, I had this this week, and I'll just share with you this, and, and then we'll have a little prayer. This week, I, last Sunday, I was in church, and Gina Fingelman came up to me, our preschool director, and one of Gary's best friends was John Mitchke. Now, you know Donna Mitchke, it's her son. And Gary and, and John used to hang out together, and, and Gina said, Pastor, I was looking at Facebook today, and I saw that Rhonda Mitchke, um, who's only 50 years old or so, that she is in, in the emergency room, and she's, uh, she's had to be resuscitated. And this was before worship service last Sunday. So we prayed for Rhonda, not knowing the full extent in both worship services. Well, that evening I called John, and that's the husband, and I said, hey, John, you know, um, how you doing? And, and so we chatted, and I said, well, I'd like to come and see Rhonda, if that's possible. Is she cognizant? He goes, yeah, she's aware every now and then. She's sedated heavily, but she's aware. And I said, okay, well, how about we do it tomorrow? And he said, no, tomorrow won't work because I think I'm going to have some family come in and they want to make sure they see her as well. I said, well, let's do it Tuesday then. So 0900 Tuesday morning, I was there at the hospital. And when I got there, you know, you don't know what you're going to walk into. So I went upstairs and, 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 and uh, I went around the corner and went over to where she was and went in and he let me in. And then when I got there, the charge nurse was trying to tell him that there was only one person allowed to be in the room at all, at all during the whole day. Only one person outside, you know, of the person in the bed, only one. And right now there were three people in there, the daughter, John, and myself. And so she was off to some side talking with John. I saw Rhonda and I looked at her and her skin was just completely yellow, her eyes yellow. And I said, Rhonda. And she opened her eyes. And for someone sedated, she was all of a sudden, I know this voice, and I hadn't seen her for a while, and she listened. And I was able to go through the proofs of the resurrection, and then I told her, and your sins are forgiven in all of this. She died a few days later. It was so cool that I was able to do that, and John even noticed, and Ashley noticed who were there, that Rhonda never took her eyes off me and was fully engaged in what I was saying the whole time. When you're sick, please call the church. We want to care for you however you want. I know some of you want to be independent in your... In your we, will, we will be discreet if you want us to be, but let us pray for you. There's a side of you which is hurting as well, and, and don't just think it's what the doctors are only telling you. There's another side, and James makes that clear. And the pandemic really made it apparent to me that, that the church in some ways has given up in some of its responsibility to what Jesus tells us to be like. And I, I, I don't know how to get it back. I'm not saying that we're terrible people and we're, we're going to hell. Because I, just, I just feel we've lost something and we're losing more of it. Because it used to be when I started as a pastor, I could go into the church, I could go to the hospital and I could go to a little room and I could go to a book of all the patients there, believe it or not, all the patients, and I could tell what denomination they were, and I would go visit all the Lutheran patients that were in there. I would know who they were. Then the HIPAA law came, took that away, and everybody, it was for good reasons. We don't want people abusing that information. But then we became, you know, just a minimalized a little bit more. Before you know it, the little room that was there became some other room because it had no purpose anymore. And you saw that the clergy parking spots were just getting sucked into the rest. And I'm not saying it's all like that everywhere, but it's just something you start to notice. And, and when it's, people are sick in this pandemic, I'm the pastor who's more than happy to be there. I've been, when this started, we had one of our members who died, and I was in the morgue with the member and with the family there because I knew the church needed to be there. I could have said no like other pastors, and people would have said, that's fine. And that's the problem I'm having right now, that we're saying that that's fine. Do we trust? What are we trusting in at times? I'm not saying science is, is not God's tool, but there's a fine line, and I don't know what it is, but I do know this, that Jesus has these plans for us, his people. There was a song by Tim McGraw years ago, Live Like You're Dying. And it was a great song. And in that song, he talked about skydiving and all these things that he's going to do, that your whole bucket list you get out. James is calling us to live like he's living. Because we follow a living God. 
And when we live a certain way, when we speak a certain way, when we sound a different certain way, we help get out of the way for the one who is the way. And that's what we're all called to do. And so I looked at this sermon, I was working on it, I said blocking and tackling. But here's another thing. As God's people, we are to remain in scriptures and we are to remain in the confessions. Now, we as Missouri Synod Lutherans, we have something unique to us. We have confessions. We have a book that takes all, like, all the words about God, 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 everywhere, all these different 66 books of the Bible. And what the Lutheran Confessions does is it takes all those into the bottom line and says, here's what we learned about God from the scriptures. Here's what we learned about the law from the scriptures. Here's this. And so our confessions keep us in line, but our confessions are also important because theology is important. This is why Bible study is important. This is why reading your portals of prayer is important. Because the deceiver, he will take the truth and he will bend it and make you think it's okay. And then his witness gets diminished in us. So we're to be people of the book. We're to be people who, like our Baptist brothers and sisters who are notorious for bringing Bibles to church, we're to be people who carry a visible Bible in our being. Let's pray. Let's pray the prayer that you already prayed. Earlier in the service, we had the prayer of the day. And this was your prayer. You already prayed it. But bow your heads now. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise and let us join in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll now receive our offerings.
It is prayer time at Epiphany. We have several prayer requests. First of all, the flowers were given by Byron and Linda Triolo to celebrate their 47th wedding anniversary. God bless you. And by David and C.J. Hager in memory of Pastor Welmer, C.J.'s brother Richard, and David's brother Jim. We ask for continuing blessings and strength and healing grace for the Mitski family at the death of Rhonda. She died yesterday morning early. And for Gary and Doris Falkenberg, who have COVID, they're at home. For Betty Kelly with lung and kidney issues and for strength and all that she's going through. For Brenda Odiambo, who took her father to the ER yesterday with fluid buildup in one lung. Mother falling and Johnson, her husband, with liver disease. My wife Melanie's right ankle and leg issues. Stan Thomas is doing better. He is out of the hospital. He's still taking oxygen. He's recovering in the motel in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And for David and Linda, for Dennis and Linda Gray, Selena and Lucas Gray, for that whole family, just strengthen all the blessings that they need. Susie Patton Strong, who is going to be having brain surgery on October the 26th. For Connie Gillette's brother Craig in the hospital with stroke. Beth Hickson's brother-in-law, Joe Strogan, who is the first West Nile virus case in Pittsburgh in the hospital in Pittsburgh. Danny Sheen's daughter, Phoebe, with COVID. Albert Benerick with right hip replacement. Lucy Ann Boley died in, in Baton Rouge. She was one of the teachers for Selena and for, uh, for Sonia and for, uh, for being her high school cheerleader coach. And then for Myra Marcano, Myra Marcano was abducted from her apartment in Orlando, Florida. She is still missing. And the police have one suspect, but they don't know where she is right now. Also, prayers of thanksgiving for Joe Donath, who started a new job this week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Please stand with me. Let us pray for the whole church, Christian church and for all people in their various needs. For the church here and around the world, witnessing to the good news in Christ, that we see the worth within one another, the value our Heavenly Father places on us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who do not know Christ but support the work of the church to meet people's physical, social, and spiritual needs, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For people who serve in positions of governmental authority among the nations, for those who raise crops and tend herds, for all who connect resources with their needs of their fellow citizens, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who struggle to put bread on the table and a roof over their families, those who face injustice and discrimination, and all who are denied human rights, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all near and dear to us who call out to God in their distress, including all whom we just listed and those whom we give to you now from our hearts, we pray that you bless those who are celebrating, bless their celebration with the joy of Jesus, bless all those who are in need, and strengthen them with the healing grace of Christ. Bless those who are grieving, and bless them, Lord, with your consolation and peace and joy of salvation. And bless all who are, are in thanksgiving. Give them the joy of Jesus always. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For ourselves, that we recognize the gifts God has placed among us by which we may care for one another in our community. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Grant us, Heavenly Father, that we ask for, that what we ask for in faith we may obtain through your unfailing mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, 
Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. to
Let us stand. Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith and the life everlasting. Pardon his peace and joy, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.